The, uh, this talk is about um, an idea of Gunnar Heinsohn's, and David was, as far as I know, not 100% convinced by Gunnar Heinsohn's ideas about chronology, but um, he was a man with an open mind and wide interests, and so he was particularly interested in this, this aspect of Gunnar Heinsohn's chronological theory that the Sumerians of ancient Mesopotamia were in some way or other related to the ancient Scythians from um, the steppe lands of Central Asia. Um, the idea is derived from Gunnar Heinsohn's uh, radically shortened chronology. Gunnar holds that all of the civilizations and peoples of the third millennium BC actually belong in the first millennium BC. He would take 2,000 years off ancient history, which is quite radical. It's, I mean, it's far more radical even anything uh, Velikovsky envisaged. But ultimately, of course, Velikovsky is the man who set the ball rolling with this idea that the chronology could be wrong and that it did need shortened. Um, so I'll explain a little bit about that. Mesopotamia is not too far from the land of the Scythians because the land of the Scythians was quite big, taken in a very large area of what was, well, what is now Russia, but, or it used to be the Soviet Union, should I say. It's now sort of a Kazakhstan and the Ukraine and uh, basically the steppe lands, the great sort of a grassland and semi-desert region of Central Asia was anciently known as the land of the Scythians. The Scythians were a nomadic people, um, generally believed to uh, be of Indo-Iranian Indo -Iranian speech. So their language would have been related to Indo-European. Um, that they did come into um, Mesopotamia is confirmed by many of the ancient authors. Uh, they're supposed to have taken part in the overthrow of the Assyrian Empire. Um, according to Herodotus and many of the ancient writers, a large uh, body of Scythians crossed the Caucasus Mountains and came into Mesopotamia and initially allied themselves with the Assyrians against the Medes and were then tricked by the Medes into um, an ambush. I think Gunnar has... Uh, that's just some of the cities. That's the statement from um, Herodotus. Um, where he talks about these events. Now, for Gunnar Heinsohn, as I say, the peoples of the third millennium are to be identified with these um, peoples and empires of the first millennium. Gunnar identifies initially, or identified initially, the Sumerians with the Chaldeans, the Akkadians with the Empire Assyrians, and the Mitannians with the Medes. How he came to these conclusions is based on the evidence of stratigraphy. He says that the material remains as found in the ground does not justify uh, 3,000 years of history that are claimed in the modern textbooks. Um, the Akkadians are a, with a great empire supposedly of the third millennium. Semitic speaking people their greatest kings were called Sargon and Naram Sin. Gunnar examined the uh, stratigraphy of northern Mesopotamia and he found that immediately above the layers of the Akkadian Empire are found the Mitannian remains or the Mita. Now, the Mitannians, exactly who they were, is controversial. But there, one thing is undoubted, that their kings all had Indo-Iranian names. Uh, 
like Shosh Tatar and Tushrata. Indo-Iranian is basically Old Persian. And Gunnar came to the conclusion that the Mitannians must be the Medes, and the Akkadians, who seem to replace them, or who seem to have gone before them immediately, must be the Assyrians whom they destroyed. Now, the interesting thing is that even conventional history admits that the Mitannians did, in fact, overthrow an Assyrian Empire. They call it the Old Assyrian Empire. They don't admit that the Old Assyrian Empire was the same as the Akkadian Empire, and yet the Old Assyrians, their two most important kings were called Saragon and Naram-Sin, just like the Akkadians. So for Gunnar, the Old Assyrian Empire and the Akkadian Empire are the same. Now, this is going to be very complicated because the old Assyrians are supposed to be in the second millennium. So you've got the Akkadians in the third millennium, the old Assyrians in the second millennium, and the Assyrians in the first millennium. So there's a triplication of history. And Gunnar believes that all this has to be brought down into the first millennium. History has been triplicated. Why that happened, again, is quite complicated, and I don't want to even try and explain it. But he... Um, identifies the Akkadians with the first millennium Assyrians of the 8th century and the Mitannians with the Medes. So he asked himself, if the uh, Scythians, who obviously played a very important part in these events, had come into Mesopotamia at this time, they must have left some trace of their existence. And Gunnar claims that he has found this in the royal burials of Ur, Ur of the Chaldeans, the biblical Ur, um, which Leonard Woolley excavated in the 1920s. Now, these are a series of immensely rich burials. Here we have the, well, it's a kind of a tabular form, the argument for reducing the third millennium events into the first millennium. So, Gunnar looked at the material in the royal tombs of Ur, and he came to the conclusion that the people buried in these tombs must be Scythians. Not Scythians of the third millennium, but Scythians of the first millennium. The Scythians who took part in the Great War, which destroyed the Akkadian or the Assyrian Empire. Um, the evidence for this is mainly to do with the artwork and the culture displayed in those tombs. Now, I have to confess that I was very skeptical about this at the start, and I thought it just couldn't be true. There is a problem of chronology. According to Leonard Woolley, the royal burials of Ur are older than the Akkadian Empire. So Leonard Woolley and conventional uh, textbooks place these burials in, in the Sumerian early dynastic period, uh, about 100 or 200 years before the rise of the Akkadian Empire. Now, even, if, even uh, from Gunnar's point of view, the burials must come after the Akkadian Empire because if these are Scythians who destroyed the Akkadian Empire, they can't come before the rise of the Akkadian Empire. So there, there seems to be, there is a problem of chronology here, and that was one of the reasons I was very skeptical about the whole thing at the start. However, when I looked at the parallels which Gunnar Heinsen, with the help of Charles Ginnenthal, I think, um, identified between the culture of the royal burials and the historical Scythians of Russia, then the parallels are significant. And there is obviously uh, a case to answer here. So I'm going to look at some of these, um, some of the artifacts from the royal burials. Uh, he did, in fact, identify a people from the Mesopotamian uh, documents that were unearthed. Uh, they found a people called the, the Guttians or the Guttians. 
and Gunnar identified them as the Scythians. The problem here, of course, is that the name Scythian uh, is written in several different ways in the cuneiform writing. So they can appear as uh, Saka or Sagas or Gasgas. So there are various, there are many variants of the name. And uh, Gunnar says that Guti was one of them, or the Kuthians as they're also called, who were uh, named as barbarians who um, entered Mesopotamia at the end of the Akkadian Empire. So he looks at the culture of the people that were buried in the royal tombs, and as I say, he finds a lot of parallels with the Scythian people. So the people in the royal graves seem to have uh, better teeth than your average Sumerian. I think Gunnar is basically saying that the people in the royal tombs were not Sumerians. They ruled over the Sumerians, but they were a, a separate race, basically, Scythians. The royal burials at Ur there's a, are characterized by human sacrifice. Um, in fact, they're actually quite notorious for the human sacrifices. Again, it's claimed that the Sumerians didn't practice human sacrifice, and Gunnar would say that this is, in fact, one uh, cultural uh, characteristic of the Scythians, which is found in the royal tombs. In the royal tombs also, you have women buried with weapons, obviously female burials. Now, again, uh, the Greek writers mentioned that some of the Scythian women were Amazons, basically, they were female warriors. And the Scythians were quite known for this. And certainly in some of the Scythian tombs in Russia, um, women are buried with weapons. So several of the women in the royal tombs in Ur seem to have been buried with weapons, which is quite strange um, for Mesopotamia, but not strange for the Scythians. So here's a tomb from Russia showing human sacrifices. Again, quite typical of the Scythians, but apparently untypical of the Sumerians, according to Gunnar Heinsen. I'm not 100% sure about that. The arch was found in some of these tombs, a corbelled arch, which is not a true arch. Um, basically, the walls come in until they reach each other at the top. And again, that is also found in the Scythian burials in, in Russia. That's some of the corbelled uh, vaults here. So there's a Scythian tomb showing the same kind of um, corbelled arch. The corbelled arch, of course, is found not just in Mesopotamia and Scythia. It's found throughout the ancient world. It's found in Britain as well. So that may be evidence, but it may not be very strong evidence. So that's a Sumerian corbelled arch as well. So a slope and ramp uh, is found again in the Sumerian and the Scythian tombs. Now there's some of the human sacrifices that were in the, the death pit at one of the royal tombs in Ur. Of 74 human sacrifices, apparently. Again, human sacrifice was also found in Egypt at a very early age. So again, it could be evidence of a Scythian connection, but it's not absolutely certain. If human sacrifice had only been found among the Scythians and among the Sumerians, then it would be stronger evidence. But in fact, human sacrifice was quite common almost everywhere in the ancient world, and probably everywhere. So from a Scythian tomb, uh, sacrificed animals as well as people. And that's also found in the Sumerian tombs. Again, that's just a comment on um, the method of sending the sacrificial victims into the, into the other world. Now, here's an illustration from the Royal Standard of Ur, showing a four-wheeled chariot. Now, Gunnar calls this a cart because 
is actually a cart. It, as a chariot, it wouldn't have gone very quickly. Um, drawn not by horses, but by asses. Now, this is conventionally believed to be the first ever chariot, and the ancestor of all chariots. You know, later they became quicker, two-wheeled, pulled by horses. Uh, but Gunnar says that, no, this is in fact a uh, Scythian cart, not a chariot. And um, it's not unlike actual... Um, so that's more... There's a, uh, a Scythian ox-drawn cart... Now, again, whether there's a connection between these two things, I, I'm not 100% sure. Um, it does look to me as if the Sumerian chariot isn't just a cart. It's, in fact, a, a war machine. And according to um, the textbooks, the Akkadians, now the Akkadians, remember, come before the Sumerians in the grave pits. If Gunnar is right, the Akkadians already used the, the light two-wheeled chariot pulled by the horse. So I don't know how the Sumerians, if they were Scythians coming after the Akkadians, could defeat the Akkadians who are using a fast chariot if they have only these cumbersome carts to pull themselves around in. It doesn't seem likely. It does look as if the people in the grave pits are, in fact, older than the Akkadians, from this point of view anyway, from the point of view of chariots and carts. Um, I'll go back there because they're not pulling bales of hay. These are pulling warriors, these, these chariots, you know. Whereas the Scythian cart looks as if it's just a cart, a farmer's instrument for carrying hay or something like that, um, corn or whatever, provisions. So here's uh, some Sumerian warriors, again with a chariot. And it, as I say, it can't be a cart. It can't be a... I don't think so anyway. It can't be just an agricultural instrument. This is, a, this is a war machine. It's got spears in the front. Um, but again, as, as I say, it's got solid wheels, it's drawn by asses, it can't have been very fast. It would have been no match for the Akkadian light two-wheeled chariot. Um, so this is a weakness in Gunnar's argument. Now, David, as I say, remember, was not completely won over by Gunnar on this issue. And I'm sure that would have been one of the criticisms that he would have um, raised. However, there are, as we'll see, there's so many illustrations here. Now, that is a Scythian from a Persian illustration. More Scythians, but at the bottom, a Sumerian warrior. And again, a Scythian warrior. Now, <clears throat> the actual culture and religion revealed in the artwork of the Sumerian burials is, I, th I think Gunnar Heinsen has presented a very good argument that there is some connection with ancient Scythia here. Um, as I say, I was skeptical about this at the start, but when I looked at the actual parallels that Gunnar Heinsen has identified, I had to rethink it. So that's a, one of the daggers found in the royal burials, and that's a Scythian dagger vague similarity. I mean, it might mean something, it might mean nothing. Um, a picture of a lion or a panther from the royal graves, a Scythian lion or a panther. Uh, it could be significant, it might not be. Sumerian jewelry. Now, the headdresses of these uh, queens or royal women in the Sumerian graves does display very um, sophisticated mastery of the goldsmith's art and they seem to be too big for the head, outsized and this was a, this was a significant fact that uh, Gunnar Heinsen mentioned 
because the same type of um, headdresses were attested among the Scythians. So it says here, wealthy Scythian women, it seems, were literally covered in gold from head to toe. Uh, the headdress covered in gold plaques, etc. So these headdresses of Scythian women were too big for their heads. They were outsized, a bit like the headdresses of the, the women in the royal tombs of Ur. And they had to have some kind of a padding so that the, the, the crown would actually fit on their heads in both cases. That's another Scythian headdress. Sumerian jewellery. Scythian jewellery. Again, certain similarity. It may be significant, it might not. And Sumerian jewellery. The use of the rosette as a decorative motif. Again, found among the Scythians and found among the Sumerians, but not unique to either country either. It's also found among the Greeks and various others. So it could be significant and it might not be. There's a rosette among and Scythian jewellery. Now, this is really significant. This is a famous... Um, sculpture of a goat caught in a thicket from one of the royal burials in Ur. Now, as an artistic motif, it's, I don't know if it's unique, it's very unusual. And I don't think it occurs in Egyptian art or Greek art for that matter. But it does also occur in Scythian art. Now, this is, I believe, quite uh, significant. Now, you can't see it here because <clears throat> The actual axe would need to be turned up that way. But these are two goats standing up on their hind legs at eating some kind of a plant, you know. And that's from a Scythian uh, axe, I believe. Well, that's uh, Sumerian again. And Scythian beneath it. Two goats again, um, antithetic opposite each other. Right, there's the two Scythian goats nibbling, um, nibbling leaves, just like the Sumerian goat and its hind legs. Um, a fairly precise cultural parallel, maybe referring to some myth. So some Scythian gold work. Now here again, from the royal standard of Ur, there's a winged panther, a, a lion or a lioness with eagle's wings. <laughs> and again, there is a similar motif found in Scythian art. Um, a winged lion, again, not unique. I mean, it's also found in Greek myth as, this, as the Sphinx and e Egyptian uh, Myth. So winged panthers around a central figure, or this here, of course, is the um, ultimately derived from the tree of life or the the world axis, the coiled serpents. Not unique either to Mesopotamia and Scythia. In fact, occurring almost throughout the world. But to have the two winged panthers on either side is fairly significant. So again, the Sumerian and Scythian winged panthers, stags in both cultures, Sumerian helmet, made in the form of a human <coughs> hairdo. And Scythian helmets apparently were fit quite similar in some ways. Scythian helmet and another Scythian helmet. Now, um, some of this art looked fantastic. You could just uh, you know, spend the whole day just looking at it. The question then is, was Gunnar 
is Gunnar Hansen right? Um, are the people in the royal tombs of our uh, Scythian invaders of Mesopotamia after the fall of the Akkadian Empire? Um, the evidence, I mean, I would have to say probably not. Um, it looks like to me that the Leonard Woolley was correct in placing these burials before the Akkadian Empire. Um, as far as I know, there's very little iron has been found. There's no iron tools or weapons have been found in the royal tombs. Maybe small artifacts of iron. I'm not too sure about that. Um, but certainly the material culture displayed in the tombs looks archaic. It looks very, very old. Um, however, that does not rule out any connection with uh, Scythia. Because I think Gunnar Heinsen has, in fact, hit on something of great importance here. I, was, uh, I worked in Hungary a few years back, and I was astonished when I was there to learn that the Hungarian language... Now, Hungarian is not related to any of the Indo-European based languages of Europe. It's virtually unique. There's supposed to be some connection with Finnish, although Hungarians say that they, they can't understand a word the Finnish people say. And there's supposed to be, again, some connection with Estonian. But the astonishing thing is that Hungarian seems to be very close re closely related to ancient Sumerian. Now, when I heard that first, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was just a crackpot theory, a fringe theory. In fact, it's been known now for several decades. And um, the similarity is not just confined to vocabulary, but also involves um, grammar and syntax. And some people say that, in fact, Hungarian is more closely related to Scythian than to any, or to Sumerian than to any other language. Now that brings to mind some of the comments. Now the, the Hungarians undoubtedly came from Scythia. Um, they came from the steppe lands of Central Asia. The ancient writers described all of the peoples who came from that region as Scythians. The Roman writers called the Huns and the Avars and the Magyars Scythians. They used that term for all of them. Now, to this day, there are uh, the Hungarian-speaking people of eastern Transylvania who claim to be direct descendants of the Huns, incidentally, still call themselves Sekes. And the name apparently has got some connection with the word Saka or Scythian. And again, that brings to mind several comments of the ancient authors. Herodotus mentions a dispute between the Scythians and the Egyptians as to who was the most ancient nation. And a Roman writer called, uh, I think his name, now I've lost my notes. I, <laughs> I had all this written out and I left it at home along with my boarding card and I wouldn't have got on the plane at all but for the, the kindly lady at the bus uh, station printed me out another boarding card. But uh, it was Trogus Pompeius, I think, um, was the name of the Roman writer, who said that the Scythians were the most ancient nation in the world and that they had inhabited Mesopotamia for 1,500 years before any of the other peoples arrived in Mesopotamia. Uh, which is astonishing. If that is correct, then it is clear that the ancient Sumerians did indeed have some link with uh, Scythia, with the steppe lands of Central Asia. And it would be a kind of a missing link between that and the connection between Hungarian and Sumerian. It's a fascinating uh, area of study, and I think it requires a lot more <coughs> Uh, investigation. 
So the conclusion I would come to is that Gunnar has not been 100% right in identifying the Sumerians with the Indo-Iranian the Indo Scythians of later times who came and destroyed this, the Akkadian Empire. But I think that the Sumerians did indeed have some connection or were directly descended from um, an ancient people of the, of the steppes, the Scythians. As I say, this idea of uh, Scythian as meaning <coughs> the ethno-linguistic connection with uh, the Indo-Iranian languages is only a modern idea. The ancient writers called all of the peoples of the steppes Scythians. That was the term they used. So, um, and of course, all the peoples of the steppes would have influenced each other culturally anyway. So we shouldn't be surprised with um, apparent artistic and uh, cultural similarities between the Sumerians and the later Scythians of the steppes. Um, I think, personally, I think it's a fascinating uh, idea and it requires a lot more study. The, I, the connection between Sumerian and Hungarian is still controversial. I think uh, the academic establishment takes a long, long time to get their heads around any new idea at all. Um, they tend to be petrified like <laughs> some of the dinosaurs that uh, they dig up now and again. Their brains seem to be uh, fossilized like a lot of them. But, uh, there seems to be some connection anyway, some very, very clear connection between Hungarian and Sumerian. And um, I think that's about it. <laughs> Any questions on that? Yeah? <coughs> Sorry to start off again. Uh, is there uh, any possibility as a diagnostic tool that uh, female mitochondrial DNA could settle some of these questions? Uh, I'm sure it could, yeah. But has um, it been tried? I don't, I don't know if it has been. A, I haven't been able to find any uh, information on that. Most of the information I've got about, for example, the connection between Hungarian and Sumerian has come from the internet. Um, I, it, was a, it was Hungarian people told me about it first, but then uh, I couldn't find much in textbooks about it. Um, so... I don't know if it has been tried. It probably hasn't. And yet, there has been a lot of uh, studies about the origins of European populations and how they did tend to come from either the Middle East or Central Asia. So I, I don't really know. It's, again, it's a question I would need to examine in more detail myself, you know. Any other uh, thoughts on that? Yeah. That's something you probably haven't looked at. Let me just explain to me, are there any other graves in Samaria that one could compare with these, which show different features? I mean, I don't know. Again, um, <coughs> I assume that, you know, the things that Gunnar... This is not the only one. Yeah. I assume that the things that Gunnar were saying were unique to the royal burials at Ur were in fact common, like human sacrifice, etc., in ancient Samaria. Because I know human sacrifice was common in uh, early dynastic Egypt. There were a number of tombs which uh, Mastaba burials where human sacrifice was quite uh, widely practiced. So I don't know. Um, the royal burials tend to be the most yeah. talked about. And, you know, so um, Gunnar seems to say here that in fact other uh, Sumerian burials have been found which don't sh show human sacrifice and don't show these parallels with Scythian uh, customs, but I, I, I can't really say for sure about that. Has any of these burials and, um, and sacrificed people had their genetics checked um, by geneticists to see if there is a link? Um, I, I, again, because I'm not... You can not still get genetic material from um, very people, can't you? Without question, yeah. Um, I mean, that would be something uh, that would be quite important to do, you know. Uh, I don't know if it has been done yet. Um, I know that genetics, genetic, uh, this genome project has already thrown up some astonishing facts. Like, for example, some of the inhabitants of the New World have Old World 
DNA in them, yes. specifically from Spain and Northwest Africa, the land of the Atlantes. So, <laughs> I mean, it's fairly, well, fairly dramatic it's things have already been produced by this. So I'm sure even more dramatic uh, revelations will come forward. Um, but at, at the moment, I can't. I can No shame. I can't be sure at the moment. Watch this, please. Yeah. <laughs> Are there Thank any other countries that have two or three thousand years missing from their chronology? According to Gunnar, yes, all civilizations rose simultaneously in the aftermath of a great cosmic catastrophe around 1300, 1400 BC. That would be Velikovsky's Venus catastrophe, which left the great uh, layer of debris at our, you know, eight to 10 foot uh, layer of silt. Um, and with the goings on in the cosmos, people were inspired to build pyramids and offer sacrifice to the gods to keep away further destruction. Uh, and the word altar, of course, just means a high place where you, where you offered these blood sacrifices. So human sacrifice was practiced all over the world at one time. So Gunnar would say that the civilizations of the new world rose simultaneously with the civilizations of the old world. Um, then again, that wouldn't explain all of the pre precise parallels between the civilizations of the old world and the new world because some of them are so precise that they can't be put down just to that. In fact, there, there is evidence of ancient transatlantic contact. Um, but yeah, Gunnar Hansen would say the Chinese civilization, the Middle Eastern civilizations, and the American civilizations all arose about 1100 BC. And all this idea of third millennium civilizations is they're all, they're all duplicates and triplicates. The second millennium civilizations are duplicates and the third millennium civilizations are triplicates of the first millennium civilizations. It's quite a radical idea, um, but there is a lot of evidence to support it, as, as far as I can see. Anything else? Any questions I can answer? Only answer, ask me questions I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. As it keeps got to be, it seems to me that possibly one of the weaknesses of Gunnar's theory is the fact that scholarship seems to accept the Scythians as being associated with a particular fairly late date in antiquity. Yes. If there were proof to show that those Scythian peoples existed many millennia earlier, it would actually make his theory very plausible. And that evidence does exist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It actually does exist that the Scythians, on their home territory, were there for many millennia before. And the antiquities in Ukraine, particularly at their own sacred site, the Kamiana yeah. Mahila, show that in the grottos, there was proto sumerian writing there from at least 12,000 BC. It's going through their history to that point mm -hmm. and then added to over the years and actually describing the flood where when the people from ancient Ukraine had travelled to Suma, mm -hmm. Mesopotamia, they were cut off by the flood. Yeah, and I mean... It actually talks about this. Yeah, I mean... It seems <coughs> astonishing, doesn't it? Which yes. It has come to wider notice. I mean, personally, I would go with Gunnar for the shorter chronology, but it doesn't rule out that uh, other areas of the world did have very early literate civilizations. I know that in uh, the Balkans region, Southeast Europe, uh, there, were, um, there was a culture there at least as old as Sumeria with uh, writing, with, with written script, the Vinta culture. Um, so, uh, and there's evidence that the megalithic peoples had some, in the Western Europe, had some form of writing as well, um, some way of record keeping anyway. Um, <clears throat> but that, I mean, that needn't completely overrule Gunnar's uh, chronological conclusions either, you know. Um, so I, th I think you have to remember that the idea that civilizations are many, many millenniums uh, older, are 
they go into you know third or fourth or fifth millennia in the past BC is largely based on um, if you go back to it, I mean it was based ultimately on a, a kind of a fundamentalist interpretation of the Old Testament. Uh, even you know Napoleon went to Egypt. Uh, 20 years before the first hieroglyphs were read, and he, look, he looked at the Great Pyramid, and he said to his men, just before the Battle of the, the Pyramids, he says, 40 centuries look down on you. So he was, he was placing the pyramids 2,200 BC. That was, that was 20 years before the science of Egyptology was even invented. Now, that is actually a date still, very close to the date still found in the textbooks. Where did Napoleon get this idea? Because he got the idea from the already existing Egyptian chronologies, which were based in the Bible, which were appearing in European textbooks at that time. <clears throat> the force of habit, of the, as I say, of the, academ the academic community is so... Um, their brains are fossilized mostly. They can't, they can't think out of the box, like, you know, they think, oh, it says in the textbook that the pyramids were built 2,200 BC, you know, we maybe take that back a century or two, but we can't just, you know, rule it out completely. It must be, it must be true, it's in books, you know. Um, but it was actually based on the Old Testament. It was based on the idea that Adam and Mene as the first pharaoh were the same person. And everybody knows Adam lived in 4,000 BC, and so many has lived in 4000 BC, and you could fill in the whole of Egyptian chronology as outlined by Manetho after that. And you had certain points, reference points, like Ramesses, the great Ramesses. He must have been the pharaoh of the Exodus because it says in the book of Exodus that the Israelites built a city called Ramesses. So it must have been him. Uh, so you place Ramesses the second, where the Bible says the Exodus is about 1400 BC. And he's still there. Oh, they've moved him down a couple of a century or two until 1300 BC. But he's, he's still there where he was placed by in Napoleon's time and 100 years and 200 years before that. So we have to be careful about all these thousands and thousands of years BC. They don't really have any scientific justification. And they're there because, because as I say, academics haven't been able to get, to get out of their head that the whole thing just needs to be swept aside. And we need to begin from the beginning, looking at what we can actually find in the ground. A principle the gunner set out, which is a very good principle, is if we can't find any evidence of it in the ground, it probably didn't exist. You know? It's, it's quite a good principle. You know? Uh, 